Hi, my name is Jill Sykes and I'm an, an advanced podiatrist working for Harrogate and District NHS Foundation Trust. My role is based at Scarborough on the east coast of North Yorkshire and we alone see lots of elderly people, um, people who have moved and retired out to this beautiful area of the country. Uh, hence we have a massive caseload and we have a big team in podiatry which I lead the high risk team. Hi, I'm Lara Chapman, Specialist Podiatrist also at Harrogate and District Foundation Trust, Jill's colleague. So together we manage uh, a really acute caseload and we're here today to try and answer some of the general questions that you may have for either your clients, your patients or if you are a patient yourself. Okay, so we're now going to show you a video and hope you get some of your answers from there. Thank you. So today we're just going to ask a few questions around general foot care, um, general questions that we're asked in our clinical practice probably on a daily basis. So how often should we cut our toenails? Well really, toenails should only be cut when they need cutting. Sometimes um, toenails are cut far too often and particularly uh, in our clinical practice we normally on average cut toenails in the elderly population every 12 weeks, every three months. However, some toenails do grow quicker than others, depending on medical condition generally and age. So on average, every three months is quite safe practice. And what should we use to do this? Normally, we will use our professional nail clippers. So these are purchased, they can be purchased on the internet, or they can be purchased at a really good chemist, such as uh, Boots the Chemist, etc and other chemists are available for these nail clippers but if not just an, a general nail clipper is, is fine but, but we also advise to be able to file toenails that will also keep the length of the nail down as it's safe to do so if it catches the skin that is safe to do and also it will get the sharp edges from the side of the nail down to stop them catching on, on socks and tights etc. And what happens if I'm diabetic? If you're diabetic and you are well controlled, you have full sensation and good foot pulses, which should be checked by your doctor on an annual basis, then you are, you are not classed at risk. You are cla classed with podiatry, low risk. So it doesn't mean that you cannot cut your own toenails and that is absolutely fine to do. Obviously, if you have any problems thereafter, then contact our, uh, the podiatry department. What happens if my toenail is going yellow? If your toenail is going yellow, it may be an indication that you have a fungal infection. On that note, it generally if things are symptomatic, if you are in pain with the toenail, then you would need to visit a podiatrist or even the GP and a nail clipping would have to be taken. The only real evidence-based good practice is for a medication tablet to be taken, but that's for quite a long time and can have some side effects with the liver. So general rule of thumb is that we do not treat fungal infections of the toenail. Also, if a toenail shouldn't be cut too short, so only cut a toenail to be the length that is safe, and um, even if you have to cut your toenails a little bit more frequently, just so that there's always a little bit of white showing of the toenail and never ever cut down sides. There is a myth as well, Lara, that um, cutting a V into the middle of your nail will help the sides grow out. That is an absolute old wives' tale um, and a definite murmur. Great, could you tell me about how we should care for, for the skin on our feet? Yeah, the, the foot is a really complex structure, uh, believe it or not, and, and the skin on the foot needs has different areas that have to have different skin integrity. So in between the toes needs to be kept as dry as possible. So never ever cream in between your toes. What that will do is donate moisture. So, and you will end up with splits between your toes, which are very, very difficult to get healed. Um, the main areas to cream as much as possible, either once or twice daily, 
is around the heels and in the arch area and that's generally with a really good emollient particularly if you've got an emollient that's got a urea base in you know 10 or 15 percent urea base cream so what causes hard skin hard skin is an area where the foot is is getting excess pressure so if the foot is rubbing on the shoe or you're walking quite differently for a long period of time um, such as walkers that get blisters as well. It's an area that our body tries to protect, so it will naturally try and form a protection, which is the hard skin. That can then lead on to what we call a corn. So that is diagnosed where there's a centre to the hard skin, and that's where the hard skin's gone underneath the, the layers of skin and has formed like a nucleus. That needs to be professionally removed by a podiatrist. The treatment of corns needs to be done professionally by a podiatrist and patients tend to go and buy corn plasters over the counter. They're really dangerous because they contain an acid, usually it's salicylic acid, and what the acid will do, it's a caustic, so it will burn the skin wherever it is in contact with the skin. And sometimes patients come in, they haven't even got the corn plaster in the right place over the corn, and all they will do is burn their skin and ulcerate their skin and form a wound, which then needs managing by a specialist podiatry team. So corn plasters are a definite no no. So, what should we look for um, in a shoe? So, footwear um, to podiatry is really important. A lot of the problems that enter into our clinics are by, caused by ill-fitting shoes and footwear is something that's made up of three measurements. So we have the length of the shoe, which is the actual size, the width, which can be extra wide, wide, normal, narrow, depending on your foot type. And then the third and probably one of the most important measurements is the depth. And it is something that people do overlook. And the depth is particularly important in patients that have deformity of their toes, such as a hammer toe, where the, the toe is more prominent, is more prone to rubbing on the tops of shoes. So the material of a shoe needs to be a, primarily a soft leather, but it can be something that's a soft material like this stretch material here, which is ideal. You also need a fastening on the shoe so that the foot is held onto the shoe and this is in the form of a velcro fastening which is ideal for patients who can't bend down to tie shoelaces and a lace up or a buckle. Also podiatrists would recommend elastic shoelaces that are available on the internet and this means that you, you have a better choice of shoe because you can thread an elastic shoelace through the eyelets and this forms like a slip on shoe but you've still got that support around the foot for the shoe. The heel counter, that's a nice deep heel counter and that will sit the Achilles tendon in nicely so a heel counter offers more support at the back of the foot. This shoe is really flexible, it's got a very flexible sole so this is good in that it will work with the foot during walking and not against the foot, therefore offering more comfort. And the sole of the shoe has got a nice non-slip tread, so this is ideal in wet weather or if they're walking on rough terrain to prevent slips, trips and falls. What happens if the feet are swollen? Swollen feet is really common in more elderly people and in certain medical conditions. And what we advise is that feet, people sit with their feet elevated onto a buffet or a footstool with a cushion on ideally above knee height when they're sat watching the TV or the reading to be able to drain that fluid back towards the heart. Should we ever walk barefoot? That is never in the podiatry advice. We, we advocate footwear um, indoors and outdoors, whether it be a good slipper, a supportive slipper, or even an, an indoor shoe. If patients are not really going out very much, an indoor shoe is ideal. 
because it offers that full support around the home when they're spending probably the majority of their day in the home and that will prevent falls as well. And is there anything we should look for in terms of uh, socks and tights? Hosiery is something that is overlooked in, in podiatry. We, we do look at um, socks and stockings um, for seams. We sometimes see really rich seams in stockings and socks and they can cause a lot of problems both on the little toe, on the big toe or across the ends of the toes where there's a very rich seam. So always look for whether there are knots at the end of, of each seam and if possible you can turn the sock inside out or the stocking inside out. That makes the seam less ridged or just look for seamless socks that are available now in the shops. And also, uh, if you have swollen feet, there are some really good um, socks available, mainly on the internet, but there are some stores that stock these that have little elastic around the tops of the socks to stop the socks from digging into the legs um, around the ankle area. So we're, we're now going to take some questions uh, via the chat. And we have one question so far from Leanne. And she's asked, how often should you use urea-based creams? Now, there are a couple of urea-based creams on the market in Good Chemist for Sale. The, there are different creams available with different names. One of, them, one of the creams is Flexitol, which is a urea-based cream. That comes in two different forms. There is a green form, which is 10%, and a red form, which is 15%. Generally, uh, urea-based creams are used on quite difficult skin, quite dry skin or callous skin. So it's always best really to um, get advice from a podiatrist about how often you should apply that cream and which one to use. The green 10% cream is more of a maintenance cream and long term. The red cream, which is the higher percentage of urea, is generally short term and normally advised once or twice a day, ideally twice a day if a patient can actually get down and access their feet to be able to apply that cream. We've got another question that's come from Facebook. What can you do for pain in the sole of your feet where your heel bone touches the floor? So I guess in the first instance, have a look, make sure there's no open wound there or redness or swelling. Um, if there is, then you need to seek medical advice. Um, potentially it could be an, a mus what we call a musculoskeletal problem like plantar fasciitis is very common um, I think in that instance in the first instance um, some calf stretches could help so check the NHS website and there's some good exercises that you can do in the first instance you also want to have a look at your footwear make sure you've got a good supportive shoe like Jill was saying in the video um, with good qualities to support the foot. Yeah, the other uh, diagnosis it could be is a calcaneal heel spur. So that is actually um, a bony growth onto the heel bone. Uh, that is generally excruciatingly painful at one spot. It's an area that you can literally put your finger on and it's really painful. That is only really diagnosed with an x-ray and thereafter you would need to then see a podiatrist for management of that spare and a lot of it is around pressure relief. So the next question uh, has come from a lady via Legs Matter. Um, she's, she has both lymphedema and lymphedema from the waist down. Her legs are very swollen and have, she has a leg ulcer. She also has a leaky heart valve and has taken to Codidromol. So that's the same patient as... So getting the right footwear, oh right, us, us, uh, that's from that, that's answered the, the question for about the heel. I would suggest that you, you see a podiatrist for a full assessment, because that could be a number of things. It could be a wound, mm -hmm. like Lara says, or it could be something more mechanical going on. Um, it might be due to the pressure with all the edema in, in the leg. 
Uh, Leanne also states getting the right footwear patients report is get, finding being getting very difficult, especially if not available through the NHS. Is there any way you advise patients to look? And that's really funny, Leanne, because we've just wrote, written that down as a question to be talking about, really. And it is hard. Um, we would always recommend that feet are measured. Uh, generally by a really good shoe shop, which are, are admittedly, they're harder to find these days. There are less and less um, good shoe shops out there. Uh, however, uh, there are some really good supportive companies who will look at a good measuring skill and uh, usually a postal company, I have to say. However, they're very good at returning items. Uh, if you can get a relative or a friend to help you, um, to measure your foot, they generally send measuring tools along with the catalogues as well. Cozy Feet are very good. Easy B is a very good footwear company and wider fit. Um, but, but we really do advocate that, that feet are measured before. Generally, as well, the biggest that people have. And um, Lara will agree, is that you um, patients will get a bigger size shoe to try and accommodate a swelling in the foot. Now that that the size of the shoe, as I explained in the video, is the length of your foot. So if you get a bigger shoe, all you're going to do is cause the movement of the foot more into the shoe and more pressure elsewhere and potential for ulceration. So the size of the shoe should not change. It's the circumference if you've got any difficulty with swelling or bony prominences. Okay, on to our next question. Next question is, are trainers any good? Say so, yes, um, a good supportive running trainer <laughs> is really good. Um, it's designed to keep your feet comfortable during a marathon. So any of the kind of top brands like Nike, Adidas, Reebok, um, Asics, they're, they're good for your feet. I'd avoid the kind of cheaper supermarket trainers that are generally not very supportive. You can kind of fold them in half um, and they, they're not particularly good for your feet. Yeah, and I think that the makeup of a trainer is, you know, they have a good fastening, they lace up very high onto the foot. They have a rounded toe box, so there's no pointed trainers around. And they've generally got a good supportive sole. I think, like Lara's mentioned, the cheaper versions tend to have more synthetic materials, which may make the feet perspire. So it is just a case of um, looking out for that. Um, they also generally come with insoles that are removable, so that if a podiatrist needs to fit an insole into a trainer for whatever reason, they can remove that existing insole to pop our prescribed insole into. Okay, so do you want the legs matter? So that's, um, what the next question is, what is a corn and how do you get them? Can you prevent them? <clears throat> <laughs> so, yeah, I think we can both answer this one with our eyes closed. Um, there are different types of corn, as we maybe mentioned in the video. Corns will come wherever there is excess pressure. So if you've got pressure on a particular area of your foot, that, whether it's due to footwear or whether it's a bony prominence, then you will get excess pressure on that side. The, the natural body's response is to harden the skin up. Eventually that skin hardens up and goes underneath the layers of the skin and forms a nucleus like a comb shape. And that is the base of your corn. So you imagine the base of the corn pressing on nerve endings. And for patients who've got sensation, um, they're particularly painful. They can come in between toes. So they'll come in between the fourth and fifth toes, mostly. They'll come on the tops of toe deformities, on bunions. They'll come anywhere that, that ropes and they need a nucleation with a scalpel, with a professional hand and only podiatrists are trained to enucleate corns. Once the corn is enucleated, the pain will go. However, if the pressure that is causing the corn is not removed, it will return. And often we do get patients coming back to us saying, oh, well, you didn't take it out last time because it's come back. It will come back if the pressure that is causing the corn is not permanently removed, i.e. good footwear advice or padding or some sort of pressure relief made by ourselves. Or if it's due to 
deformity in soles uh, made by podiatrists as well can help to deflect from the corn area. Sometimes in extreme cases, uh, it has been known that we refer to our orthopaedic team and they can do a little bit of corrective surgery on the foot to stop that prominence or bony deformity. But that generally is in, in an extreme case. So another question has come uh, from Leanne. Thank you, Leanne, for all your questions. Um, what is a corn? How do you get them? How do you, oh, no, sorry. In terms of bunions or hamatose, are these normal? Do these need treatment? Well, corns, bunions and hamatose are all deformities that occur at the front of the foot, so from the middle of the foot to the end of the foot. And generally, hamatose are secondary to bunions. So a bunion will is a very, very strong joint. It's the main ball of the foot. And the deformity will push the smaller toes out. So the smaller toes are made to go upwards. And you then can end up with deformity on the top of the hamater or right on the very end of that hamater. Now, it is quite normal, it is common, and there are two main causes for these deformities. For the bunion, it, it's more around, it can be hereditary. So if your grandma, your mum, or even your father has had bunions, we normally take a family history, or bad fitting footwear. The combination of the two is a definite no-no, but, but ill-fitting footwear is is one of the common causes. There'd be no family history, but they've worn stiletto shoes for a lot of years. So it is very normal and extremely common. A lot of the time, if bunions are managed properly and hamatose are managed properly with decent footwear, good fitting shoes, then not, people can go through life without having to have any intervention at all. Um, so next question is, if you are a runner, is it worth getting your gait analysed for over or under pronation and getting appropriate shoes for your gait or will any good trainer be okay? Um, I think there's different theories on gait analysis and how useful it is. I would say that the majority of people need just a good, stable, neutral trainer unless you have any major sort of foot deformity that requires extra support for that kind of flat footedness. Um, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, exactly that. And I, I think unless you're developing knee, knee pain, back pain, for instance, or hip pain, any further joint pain during running, um, we, we would advise a, a good neutral, make sure it's a neutral trainer. So there is no point in going for an anti-pronatory trainer if you have a supinated foot and vice versa. And you will see in the, in the trainer shops um, that they do sell anti-pronatory trainers. And they're no good for somebody that doesn't pronate. So if you are having foot problems or further joint problems higher up, then it's best to get an assessment at a good running shop. And they will normally assess the gait pattern, put you onto a treadmill and advise you on, on a, an extremely expensive pair of trainers. <laughs> I think also like it's important to remember that pronation is a normal part of gait. So unless you're having problems like pathologies from over pronating, then you don't necessarily need an anti-pronatory trainer. Any more questions from anyone? Lara, you've got one for me. Well, Jill, what would happen if I cut my toenails too short? Okay, so a lot of patients ask us, um, because we only generally see patients every, on average, every 10 to 12 weeks for routine nail care, if they are unable to do their own toenail care. We, we would normally advise them that. They'll, they'll generally say that that's too long to go and that the toenails are too long. And we're always asked to cut the nails really short. The problem we have there is that we, we get more complications with um, toenails being cut too short than being too long. Obviously, if they're, they're going, going too long and they're making problems with digging into the other toes, etc., then they do need cutting. However, it tends to be more the sharp edges that you can file rather than the length. If you cut the toenail too short, it will the skin around the nail will start to roll over the nail plate and you will end up with potentially with ingrowing toenails. 
or what we call a paronychia, which is an inflammation of the skin down the sides of the nails. Now, this in somebody that's got full sensation is really painful. In somebody that has no sensation in their feet, can manage and go on until that is in, got infected and potentially is a real problem needing antibiotics for. So the longer the toenail, the better. And I certainly don't cut my toenails every six to eight weeks and that is absolutely fine um, we do occasionally get some patients whose toenails grow really quickly and that's fine as well we just assess them according to need so another question's come in how do you treat burning feet well um that's that is a difficult question i'm not sure in what sort of context context that's come from the legs matter panelist um a, a little bit more information on that would would be it might be due to the um if you are a nurse and you're asking that question which you maybe are is that we get a lot of nurses that have that and it's generally due to the footwear and the flooring that you work, you're walking and working on for hours and hours and hours. We, we know that nurses probably have one of the, as a profession, have one of the worst sets of feet. And that tends to be because of the, the flooring. And um, we, we, occupation is a massive, massive hazard to us as podiatrists. It might be that you have burning feet because you're in enclosed shoes with hot floors, concrete floors, and you're doing a lot of hours. So it's more around maybe looking at um, different, different footwear that will give you a breathable sole unit that will help to cushion um, those floors. I hope I've answered that question right. Maybe a bit more information if, if that's not answered it for you. I suppose if there's any kind of, if you're having sensations of pins and needles or painful sharp pains, and that needs checking out further, it could be neuropathy, so loss of feeling, linked to loss of feeling. <clears throat> yeah, I think in, in any doubt, if it continues, we always say, you know, to, to either refer to your GP to, to send you to see a podiatrist or, or if you have direct access, if you're diabetic, to refer directly to your podiatry department. So I, I think around, what, what is athlete's foot, Lara? <laughs> athlete's foot, tinea pedis is its real name. And that is a fungal infection of the feet. Um, it can occur between the toes, uh, and they can go quite soggy between there, or it can occur on the soles and the, like the side of the feet where it's more kind of dry, itchy skin. So how do I get it? Where do I get it from? Um, you can get it from, it likes sort of moist, warm environments. So, um, Swimming, so changing room yeah. areas. Yeah, um, it, it just, it, it loves moist areas. That, that's why it will collect in between the toes here. You generally find the patient has got a history of fungal infection of their toenails. And that is when the toenail goes brown, yellow discoloration, a little bit thickened. It normally doesn't bother the patient, but it's just a bit thickened and it doesn't look very nice. However, it, it then can lead to um, fungal infection between the, the toes. So if I've got a fungal infection between my toes, it's really itchy, Lara, what, what would you recommend? I probably recommend like a, a caniston spray um, and also be wary that that fungal infection can kind of live in, in your shoes and on your bed, bed sheets and um, towels as well. So it's about washing them at sort of 60 degrees and uh, there's also powder that you can get to put in your shoes that will, once you've treated the infection, will ensure that it doesn't come back. And if, if um, I, my feet perspire a lot, I'm in steel toe cap boots all day long, I'm a nurse, I'm in hot, hot floors all day, my feet perspire in between the toes, what would you recommend to prevent that from happening again once I've cleared it up? With surgical spirit? Uh, okay. Surgical spirit, so, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> surgical spirit is great uh, for between the toes to basically dry things up. Um, I think it's best to make sure the skin is intact when you do that. Otherwise, you will be uh, this mighty sore to be putting surgical spirit straight onto a, 
an open area. So what what is the split around the heel there? Oh, we've actually had a oh, question. We've had a qu <laughs> question. Alan has now our car has asked a diabetic fee with severe dementia patient who is bed bound. Um, who should refer to, well, who should we refer to podiatry or tissue viability nurse? Podiatry <laughs> is the answer to that one. I mean, obviously tissue viability nurses and podiatry work like that. We're hand in hand in our care that we, we, we always offer advice to each other. The tissue viability nurse is a fantastic company management as our podiatrists, but together we try and conquer what are, with diabetes and dementia, very, very complex fees. And um, being bed bound, very prone to pressure areas. So it is, it is very nursey and very podiatry as well. So in the first instance, as podiatrists, we would probably go out and assess, and then even arrange a joint assessment with ourselves and the TVNs. So first instance podiatry, let them do the full assessment, and then we'll pull in the TVNs to, to help us if we need help along the way. I suppose it depends on, you say diabetic foot, but I guess it depends on the actual problem. So if there's a ulcer, I think that's what Jill's thinking of. Um, yeah, our pressure damage. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it sounds as though there maybe is a wound if we're thinking about tissue viability nurse. But yeah, uh, we, we, our roles overlap so much and over my years, I've worked so closely with tissue viability nurses and I still learn um, hundreds of years later, like I feel I've, I've been a podiatry sponsor. I think that's it. And uh, no more questions seem to be coming our way. Thank you very much. And we'd like to end this video. Thank you. Thank you.